pleasure being here. Let me start by uh, thanking organizers, Jarro, who just left Theo, other organizers, uh, for inviting me over to here to join this uh, very nice, uh, useful uh, workshop, I guess, and uh, giving me the opportunity to give this uh, tutorial, where actually I, uh, I want to emphasize uh, that two fields are rapidly merging, like already uh, mentioned uh, by, by Theo. Uh, femtomagnetism <coughs> and uh, spintronics, or you could also say spintronics and, and photonics. And uh, being a tutorial, I, uh, I do address a bit of some of our uh, recent uh, progress uh, at Eindhoven University of Technology, and two of the topics are in the subtitle. But also being a tutorial, I will uh, try to emphasize most of all the, the generic uh, uh, physical phenomena which are underlying. If uh, anything is unclear, just stop me and... Uh, Raise your hands or shout at me and I will try to be uh, more clear. Uh, for those of you who have not seen uh, this picture here yet, uh, uh, I uh, ask for your patience. I will explain at my, uh, my very last slide what it is. So I would like to thank Theo also for kind of introducing my introductory presentation. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but maybe for those who are a bit more outsider, it is useful to hear things uh, think twice. So, uh, as already mentioned by Theo, a lot of things can happen if we fire a femtosecond laser pulse at a ferromagnetic material. Uh, one of the basic things is uh, we heat up the material, and if the laser intensity is high enough, we can quench the magnetic moment, uh, as uh, uh, report reported first to occur at a really femtosecond time scale by this pioneering paper which uh, Theo was referring to. If you have proper conditions, you can also get a processional uh, uh, mode of the uh, ferromagnetic material being excited uh, for very specific materials like iron rhodium who has a specific, specific uh, 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 phase transition. You can even heat up material and drive a material from a paramagnetic or an antiferromagnetic into a ferromagnetic phase and thereby by laser heating at a very short time scale induce a ferromagnetic moment and uh, like I also mentioned before of course since about 10 years a new uh, possibility has emerged of using single femtosecond laser pulses to switch the magnetization from one direction into the other, and either using circular polarized light or using a kind of toggle switching scheme, which I will uh, also uh, zoom into uh, more, uh, more detail later. Uh, this uh, image has been shown already, uh, the first pioneering work in this direction, Nijmegen Group in 2007, where for the first time they showed it's possible to really not only quench, but really switch the magnetization by a femtosecond laser pulse, using in this case the velocity of the light, and uh, as also already uh, referred to by Theo, uh, uh, a couple of years later, in 2014, I think, the group of uh, Stéphane Mangin in a larger cons uh, consortium showed that this is even possible for ferromagnetic, uh, ferromagnetic uh, thin films, whereas the previous experiment was all on ferrite magnetic alloys, where you have two sublattices where the spins are, propagating, uh, are pointing in the opposite direction. All of this is local processes. And uh, just to return to the basic one, we come in with a laser pulse, we heat up a thin ferromagnetic film, thereby we induce thermal disorder and the magnetization is shrinking. In principle, not a very special uh, uh, phenomenon. The special thing is that it is so fast. In this case, it's just a heating scenario. But we now also know since about a decade that these uh, uh, ultrafast laser heating also produce health carriers which are mobile and thereby you can induce spin transport, a spin current. And uh, in the one case, uh, the, the, the explaining this phenomenon is all about dissipation of angular momentum locally, whereas in the other case, it is about transport of angular momentum. And actually, these will be the first topics I will briefly introduce in my presentation. I will start with the local process, a little bit of background to give you the proper background for understanding the rest, and then I will switch to the spin transport. Now, in my final second, and it's clear that here, spintronics is emerging, basically, because we have spin polarized currents, or spin currents even, they can apply spin torques, etc. So all the mechanisms we know from, from spintronics are actually now becoming available in this domain of femtomagnetism. Now, there's another way of integrating uh, uh, magnetism with, uh, with uh, uh, femtomagnetism with spintronics. And actually, that is also very much linked to the SPICE network, which uh, Theo was introducing. In Eindhoven, uh, since 2014, we have a center of excellence, which is on integrated photonics. And there we set up a project uh, in which we try to really uh, establish magnetic functionality in integrated photonic chips. 
So bridging the world of photonics and magnetism, and also play there the tricks of femtomagnetism. Now, uh, as to the general ideas, uh, we uh, want to uh, uh, use ultra-thin magnetic claddings on top of uh, integrated photonic waveguides, and thereby use non-reciprocal effects, magneto-optical effects, to have mode conversion in, the wave, in these waveguides. Uh, of course, we would like to implement all optical switching, but really then in an integrated photonic fashion. And finally, while being in the magnetic domain, we want to play spintronic tricks. For instance, like merging with uh, uh, racetrack kind, magnetic racetrack kind of phenomena, where we use the phenomenon of current-induced uh, domain wall motion. And this actually will be the last part of my presentation where I give a bit of my background on the uh, all optical switching, show that nowadays we can do it indeed in these kind of materials, which also display the, ultra fa the, the very fast current-induced uh, domain wall motion. So that's on the agenda, and clear that this is an other way of merging femtomagnetism uh, with uh, spintronics. Okay, well, uh, Talking being the first speaker, indeed I felt I had to slow show this graph, of course all of you know about it. The first experiment in 1996, uh, where using femtosecond laser pulses, uh, you do a pump probe experiment, you measure the magneto-optical contrast, a certain time delay after heating up the ferromagnetic thin film, nickel in this case, with a femtosecond laser, and you see surprisingly, at least in those days, that the magnetic uh, moment disappears well within the first picosecond, a couple of hundreds of picoseconds. And you can describe that in terms of different uh, interactions between the electronic lattice and spin degree of freedom. And like uh, Theo also mentioned, very sadly, earlier this year, both uh, the first and the last author of this uh, pioneering work uh, passed away. Of course, a big loss for the field. And also, uh, yeah, it's uh, really a tragedy. But uh, what these uh, two researchers also did apart from coming up with these first experiments, they actually introduced a very useful phenomenological model, which is the three temperature model. What we do in that case, I already uh, mentioned that we can describe this process by the interaction between the electronic, the lattice, and the spin degree of freedom. What we can do, we can assign, we can consider, consider each of these heat bars as being internally and thermally equilibrium. Then we can assign a temperature, an electron temperature, a phonon temperature, and a spin temperature. We assign heat capacities to the three bars, and we assign coupling constants, which determine the rate of energy exchange between them. We assume that the laser pulse ex makes electronic excitations and thereby heats up the electron temperature, and thereby you get a very simple uh, uh, set of three coupled differential equations, which you can kind of fit to your experiment, and uh, you get simply these uh, results here. The red curve here is electron temperature, which you see is rapidly rising after uh, 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 absorption of the laser pulse. Then there's electron phonon coupling, which gives rise to a cooling down of the electron temperature where the lattice heats up. And then finally, you see that the spin temperature, indicated in green, is rapidly following the electron temperature. Now, the spin temperature is just a measure of a magnetization, and when the spin temperature is high, the magnetization, indicated by this green line, is low. And this graph kind of resembles what has been measured in the experiment. And the surprising thing now is that this demagnetization time is even shorter than the time scale in which the electron and the lattice system are equilibrating. OK, you couldn't then do this uh, for different materials. Many groups have started every kind of reproduce this effect. And I just show here two typical results showing that although in many cases you see time scales of typically a few hundred femtoseconds, there are also materials which show a much slower demagnetization. For instance, the 4F material, like gadolinium, you see that actually it takes typically 50 picoseconds to reduce the magnetic moment, and even there's a kind of two-step process, a rapid uh, process in the first one or two picoseconds, and then a slower process. Now, in a sense, it's not so strange that it has a different behavior. It's a completely different ferromagnet. This is a 3D ferromagnet. This is a 4F. This is a higher temperature, 660, 630 Kelvin, a lower uh, uh, clear temperature, uh, a very low magnetic moment, and a very high magnetic moment. Now, I could say more about this, but I know that Martin Weinold actually has this especially on the menu, so I will refer to the tutorial by Martin to uh, talk more about this. Actually, the take-home message in the moment is just that uh, gadolinium is much slower than cobalt and nickel and iron, and keep that in mind. Now, uh, one slide in which I would kind of 
say a little bit more microscopically what is going on and what we can learn from experiments. And actually here I claim that what we see is mostly, mostly uh, dominated by just kind of thermodynamic uh, uh, processes. And that the fact that we have laser field for 100 femtoseconds and very highly excited electrons is not the dominant feature uh, in uh, the experimental demagnetization. And one can deduce that from instance from these experiments, which is on the cobalt thin film, you see now increasing the laser fluence, you get more demagnetization, magnetization as a function of, of time. Uh, but moreover, you see that the magnetization is slowing down gradually. And you go to the highest fluences, you see there's a demagnetization up to about half a picosecond, maybe even a picosecond. No discontinuities here. And from that, I think the message is uh, that actually the fact that during about 50 to 100 femtoseconds, you have this high laser field and these very highly excited states is not a driving mechanism for this demagnetization. There are other arguments uh, like uh, 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 electronic heating. You can also look at the indirect uh, demagnetization. You can uh, absorb laser light, uh, uh, create hot electrons. They can uh, transverse through even up to 200 nanometers of, co uh, of uh, copper. They arrive then in a cobalt platinum layer and they give rise to demagnetization almost at the same time scale, but just a picosecond later, way beyond the time that there was this uh, uh, high uh, electromagnetic field in the material. And you can even do it by Joule heating. Now, this is all probably going to be explained in the tutorial by Stefan Manger and Jeffrey Boker, I think, who also arrived over here. Yes, <laughs> I'm sure they will be uh, uh, talking about this. Now, then there's a whole list of... Uh, of uh, mechanisms being proposed for this ultra-fast magnetization dynamics, uh, and I will very briefly go through them very rapidly. Uh, there are some uh, uh, interesting theories which uh, uh, make use of the photon field as a driver for demagnetization. These processes may be of much interest, but I think they are not dominating for the demagnetization which we see for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, there is spin transport which can contribute to the demagnetization. Well, that will probably be addressed by, uh, in the lecture by uh, Peter Oppenier. There is very interesting developments in Apanicio calculations plus many body cluster calculations. I won't say a word about that because it will all be covered in the uh, presentation by uh, uh, Sagita Sharma. And then there's here a class of three, uh, three uh, uh, models, which uh, uh, maybe from first sight look rather different, but in the end they produce quite similar magnetization dynamics. And in all of them, it is kind of assumed that the magnetization, the angular momentum, is being dumped somehow in the lattice. These are the atomistic LLG, in which you uh, set up a lando lichfeld gilbert equation uh, for, each, for, for individual atoms, and thereby you get a spin disorder, you introduce a stochastic term, and thereby you can uh, also simulate demagnetization uh, you can do it also with the lando lichfeld block approach, where you have a kind of lando lichfeld gilbert equation, but now also a second equation which describes the shortening of magnetization vector. So not lando lichfeld gilbert where the magnetization is only processing, conserving its magnitude, but also having a uh, differential equation for the uh, longitudinal component. And there is an approach which I will be discussing more in my next two slides, which we have dubbed the microscopic three temperature model. I will say more about that. But I emphasize that all of them give very similar magnetization profiles as a function of time. And what could even say so for a last model, which I would like to emphasize uh, here, maybe I should say one more word about this microscopic free temperature model. The crucial mechanism we assume there for the loss of magnetic moment is so-called phonon-mediated Elliot effect spin flip scattering. That's basically you have a spin, uh, you have a, uh, an electron scattering by emitting or absorbing a phonon, and there's a finite probability of flipping the spin. But this can also occur when you just have electron-electron scattering. And uh, thereby you could say also this last uh, uh, model, as uh, uh, developed by, uh, by Schneider's group, is in a sense uh, very similar to what we are doing. Okay, so uh, a few words about uh, the, uh, the approach we have developed in Eindhoven which is a kind of microscopic extension of the three temperature model. So we describe uh, electrons, spins, and phonons. And we do so using a model Hamiltonian, a quantum mechanical model Hamiltonian, which is as simple as possible. And for that reason, we use an assumption of free electrons with a certain temperature. So a constant density of states 
and then uh, governed, the occupation governed by Fermi Director statistics. We have a spin system, for which we just use a mean field wise model that has a spin up and spin down uh, with an energy splitting, which is uh, determined by the interaction with the average spin in the system. So if you have less magnetization in your system, also this energy splitting is getting smaller. And finally, we use either a very simple De Bayer or Einstein model for the phonons. Now in these systems, we can make electronic excitations from an occupied to an empty state. We can make spin flip excitations, and we can also excite a phonon. These processes, of course, require interaction Hamiltonians. And for those, we have electron-electron scattering. And our assumption there is actually that it is so efficient that the <laughs> thermalization time is getting zero. Basically, you can imagine if the electron-electron scattering is very efficient, then you immediately get to thermal equilibrium within your electronic system, and that is the assumption which you're making. We have uh, electron phonon scattering. An electron can scatter either up, uh, emitting or absorbing a phonon. And uh, this gives an additional uh, efficiency parameter, but we just fit it to the experimentally observed uh, equilibration time between the electron and the uh, 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 lattice temperature which was about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 picoseconds in the experiments which I already introduced before. And then finally, we have this elliott effet process, elliott effet process, where we have, in this case, an electron with a certain spin, uh, emitting a phonon, scattering is a phonon, and then there's a finite chance, A sub SF, that the spin is being flipped. And this, of course, is now the crucial parameter in the theory. Now, it's not a completely new parameter, because actually you may know it from, uh, from spintronics. If you go to spin transport uh, uh, theory, uh, you also have a spin flip probability, which, uh, which uh, links the uh, momentum scattering time and the spin flip scattering time, and you can even work it out in terms of the spin flip length, the spin diffusion length. So actually this parameter <laughs> is very similar to what you may have come across in spintronic theory from the, uh, from the 90s, and you also find that the order of magnitude here uh, is going to be very similar to what you need for the same materials in spintronics. So another link you could say between spintronics and phantom magnetism. Now, if you have this model Hamiltonian, you can use uh, Fermi's golden rule, solve a set of uh, uh, Boltzmann rate equations, and uh, the end is just a very simple set of three differential equations. One for the uh, uh, development of the electron temperature, the lattice temperature, the phonon temperature, and the magnetization, where the small m is in this case the magnetization divided by the saturation magnetization. You see a very compact expression which you now can use to describe the magnetization dynamics. There's a very important prefactor here, this r, and here it is written out in terms of the, let's say, microscopic parameters. And these are all parameters which we know except for the spin flip probability. We can plug in typical parameters, a curie temperature of nickel, the atomic moment of nickel, the, the, bio, uh, the, the, the bio energy for nickel, and we fit uh, this GEP, the coupling constant between the electrons and the lattice, uh, to fit the uh, uh, experimentally observed equilibration time between the electron and the lattice system, and the, then we find this value. And you can work it out that if we have the spin flip probability approximately 0.1, we readily get a time scale of about 60 femtoseconds. Of course, the dynamics is more complicated. You have to work out also this term. But order of magnitude, you <laughs> readily get a 100 femtosecond time scale. Now, if you want to do, go more details, of course, you can solve these uh, differential equations numerically. It's a very simple code. Everyone can do it, for instance, in Mathematica. And if anyone is interested, I'm uh, uh, available in the breaks to show you how this works. It's very intuitive to work to plug in these differential equations and see what comes out in different limits. Okay, so far the general introduction about local processes. As a next step, I want to go to the non-local processes, and that is I have these laser pills coming in, and now exciting uh, hot electrons, they're mobile, and somehow I can spin currents, which can be induced by this femtosecond laser pulse. And the crucial thing, property we now have to describe, is the transport of angular momentum. Now, the fact that uh, we uh, have these kind of laser-induced spin currents for the first time was signaled by uh, Greg Malinowski while he was uh, at Eindhoven as a postdoc. And what he did was the following experiments. He had experiments with two sets of uh, platinum cobalt multilayers with perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. 
and he noticed with a spatial layer in between, and he noticed that the demagnetization profile depended on whether the two components had a magnetization parallel or anti-parallel. So somehow they must be commu communicating. And he also found that this was also basically, you see in this case, for the parallel case, you have the slightly different demagnetization profile, slightly in the parallel case, slightly less efficient and slightly slower than for the anti-parallel component. And uh, this was only happening if you had a metallic spacer and it, it, not if you had an insulating spacer. So only if the spins could communicate by transport, then you saw this subtle difference. It's small, but reproducible. Now, partly motivated by this, Peter Oppenier took the challenge to uh, explain it theoretically, and then he came up with this uh, theory for super diffusive spin transport, where actually the idea is that if you have this excitation, laser excitation, for instance in nickel, you excite uh, hot carriers, spin up and spin down, majority and minority, but the lifetime of the two is different. And it basically means the one which has the largest lifetime, and those are for nickel, the majority spins, they will propagate furthest. And thereby I induce a spin polarized current in the material. And I think that Peter will be talking more about that. Uh, nevertheless, one slide on basically what happens inside the material. Here you see a very schematic band structure of uh, density of states of nickel spin resolved. You see the D band, narrow D band, and the broad SP band. I make an optical excitation, and of course it can already be that it optically excites more of the one type of electrons than the other, which on itself can be a source of uh, spin uh, current. But also uh, the lifetime of these majority electrons is uh, larger than the one of the minority, because the minority ones can scatter to these, uh, these uh, uh, empty states in the D bands above the, uh, above the Fermi level and thereby have a larger space, a phase space for scattering and thereby have a shorter lifetime. And thereby you can excite the material. You see that the minority electrons decay much more rapidly. The majority electrons travel further and thereby at the end I could induce a majority spin current into the neighboring layer. However, this is just one, but let me, one more uh, comment maybe. Uh, in this case, you would say I have a spin polarized current, but of course, if I transfer the charge, there will be uh, immediately a, 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 a screening current which has to oppose this build of a charge in the device. And this will be a very efficient process. So at the end, actually, we would have to take into account both the super diffusive currents as well as the, uh, as the screening currents. But you can also go to other limits. Assume now that this film is so thin that all the electrons will be leaving. In that case, you could say, I end up in a ballistic regime where the uh, difference in spin lifetime is not of relevance, and I could still have a spin current. Also, in this case, of course, I would have a screening current. Finally, I could go to a much thicker film in which you could say, all the electrons have already decayed before reaching the interface, but then I would still be left for these films on the femtosecond time scales with strong thermal gradients. And if I have thermal gradients in a ferromagnetic material uh, via the so-called spin-dependent Zeebeck effect, I will also have a spin current. This is a con uh, also a concept which is well known from spintronics, from the subfield of spin calorytronics. So basically, if you would have some thicker films, then still, even if all the scattering is over, I may be left with thermal gradients, which may pump spin into a neighboring uh, layer. <coughs> so a whole bunch of different mechanisms, and I even uh, uh, did not include all the possible mechanisms which there are. Now, it has been uh, demonstrated by many groups experimentally that indeed you have these uh, spin currents. You can measure by different means. You can uh, do it for a bilayer. You can heat up, for instance, an iron film. And you can also, by magneto optical Kerr effect, probe the spin accumulation in a non-magnetic neighboring layer, has been done, for instance, uh, for gold. So you just measure the moke and the imbalance in spin up and spin down in the paramagnetic material, and thereby you can prove that indeed spin current is pumped into the gold. Several groups have, have done that. Well, you can look uh, uh, at it by uh, changes in the magnetization profiles, like I already introduced before, other groups who did that. Uh, but in, all, in this case, there is a kind of uh, difficulty, and that was already apparent in the experiment of Malinowski, and that is what we do, uh, we have two collinear systems, we pump in spins from an other direction, but thereby we're getting enormous spin accumulation in the other material. And this would be immediately 
uh, creating a, a backward flow of a spin current because the system wants to get back to, uh, to equilibrium, either by local dissipation of angular momentum, which we know is taking place at 100 femtosecond time scale, or by spin currents. So if we use this approach, you would expect only effects which survive for a very short while, like uh, observed in the Malinowski experiment. There is an other interesting configuration, and that is if you would do the same experiment, but now with a non-collinear system. In that case, we know from, uh, from spintronics, we have a spin transfer torque. This orthogonally polarized spin current is very efficiently absorbed by this other layer and will give a canting of a magnetization just by the phenomenon of spin transfer torque. The angular momentum is transferred from the one layer where it's lost by the demagnetization to the other layer. And a couple of groups have also measured these kind of effects. And I'm zooming into that in my next slide. This was our first experiment where we demonstrated this effect. And we did it so for, for this uh, composition. We had a couple of repeats of cobalt nickel, ultra thin films with a perpendicular magnetic anisotropy. We had a thin spacer layer, and we have a top uh, uh, cobalt uh, uh, film which has an in plane magnetization. Now, uh, we come in with our laser pulse, and uh, we induce spin currents, spin currents which are left-right oriented, pumped downwards, up-down, pu uh, pumped upwards. The spin currents transfer angular momentum, which is absorbed by the other layer, and thereby the two layers are going to be canted. Now, this situation, in this new situation, the magnetization is no longer along the local uh, uh, easy axis, thereby there's an effective field on this magnetization, and the magnetization will be start processing. In a principle, since the local effective field might be different in the two layers, I might observe two different uh, frequencies. As you can indeed see in the experiment, you see that uh, you get an oscillatory signal on a time scale now of uh, hundreds of picoseconds, because this is just uh, precessional motion. And uh, most interestingly, you see that you can decompose it into two precessional frequencies, one for the one layer and one for the other. And if I reverse any of the layers, you see that the phase is reversed by 180 degrees, as you would expect. If I change uh, this, uh, in this layer here, the spins of the opposite nature uh, transfer the opposite uh, angular momentum, and the harmonization will come downwards instead of upwards. So in principle, this is all well understood. I will uh, say a few more words about this effect. First of all, a simplification of the experiment. If uh, you do some engineering, you take care that, uh, uh, that the anisotropy of the bottom layer is uh, very strong. You can get rid of one of the two precessions. Thereby, the experiment is easier to read because now we have only one precession left. And uh, now an interesting graph is the following. What you see here, uh, the induced magnetization, the induced Z component of a magnetization, because we're doing a polar experiment as a function of pump probe delay time, but no, uh, br uh, note the axis break, here a first few picoseconds, and here the hundreds of uh, picoseconds later. What we see here at the first picoseconds is just an ordinary demagnetization curve of the bottom magnetization. It's pointing upwards. If the magnetization is shortening, we will notice in a polar uh, Moog experiment. On a longer time scale, we see a precessional signal, which is the top layer, which is precessing out of the plane. You can see the both effects in the very same experiment, and thereby you can calibrate the one effect with respect to the other. And if we know the amount of demagnetization which there is in, in the bottom layer, we can thereby have a quantitative probe of how much precession there is in the top layer. Now, thereby we can define two important parameters. One is a kind of efficiency parameter, eta, which is defined as the uh, amount of magnetization absorbed by the top layer induced in the canting divided by the loss of magnetization in the bottom layer. So how much of the lost magnetization from the bottom one is transferred to the top one. And the other one is just the canting angle, uh, which we uh, normalize by the, uh, the amount of, the relative amount of demagnetization of the bottom layer to get a constant. And you can see in this case here, the canting angle is plotted as a function of uh, the percentage loss of the magnetization. And you see a nice uh, straight line, meaning the effect is linear and thereby you can define a kind of efficiency, uh, an amount of canting angle per loss of magnetization. And actually, you see that in the experiments we are doing, uh, the angle is relatively small. The out-of-plane uh, uh, out angle is uh, about a tenth of a degree for a couple of percent magnetization loss in the bottom layer. 
uh, and you have a processional, uh, an elliptical procession, the in-plane excursion is about uh, a half a degree. Now, I will address two questions. One is, uh, how uh, are these spin currents uh, generated? And in order to get some more insight, what you can do is you can change the thickness of the bottom electrode from which the spin current is pumped into the top one. And uh, I mentioned that we do experiment with uh, cobalt nickel PMA structure, and we can now just simply change the number of repeats. And what you see here uh, at the left is the canting angle uh, per percent of loss of magnetization. And you see that, uh, yeah, there's a question mark here, that's because the, the, the first data point is a little bit less sure because it was difficult to get the first layer uh, completely out of plane. So this is a bit, uh, uh, forget about this one. But in principle, you can see that roughly uh, the amount of canting angle scales up to four repeats, up to about four nanometers, uh, is linear in the, the thickness of the bottom electrode. If you have more material, more, uh, more loss of magnetization in the bottom electrode, there's more absorbed in the top one. You can also plot it as a function of efficiency, and if you plot the same data as a function of efficiency, you see a kind of constant. That means that the amount of, if you have more loss in the bottom one, uh, uh, you also had more gain in the top one. Now, in principle, I will not say too much about this, but you can imagine that this, yes, uh, I will, come, sorry, uh, that this is helpful in identifying the mechanisms because basically different mechanisms make, uh, give rise to different effects. Yes, thank you. Is, is it dependent on the thickness or it is purely how much is excited? So if you include, increase the fluence but kept the number of layers the same? Uh, uh, like I showed in the previous, uh, it, 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 everything is linear in the fluence. Yeah, everything is linear in the fluence and thereby we don't, ha don't have to bother about that if we uh, plot it in a normalized way. Okay, so this, uh, this may be helpful in future to understand which of the mechanisms is relevant for this case. Another interesting question is uh, how, uh, uh, how is a transverse moment absorbed in the top layer? And for that, we change the thickness of the top layer. We can now do it in a continuous fashion because this is uh, uh, not this uh, multi-layered uh, multi uh, cobalt nickel structure. Uh, we can just grow a wedge and then measure locally uh, the uh, uh, induced uh, precessions as a function of thickness of the top electro of the top layer of cobalt. And then we see that the canting angle here, as a function of thickness, drops off almost as a one over thickness dependence. That basically means if we halve the, the, the thickness of the cobalt, the canting angle is twice as large. You can imagine that means that the same amount of angular momentum is absorbed in the thinner film. You can also plot it again in terms of the efficiency, and you see that means that the efficiency is approximately constant, uh, about 4%. This is where our earlier measurements nowadays, we can reach about 10% of the magnetization loss in the, bottom, uh, lost in the bottom one is being absorbed and transferred to the top one, and thereby giving uh, rise to canting of the top one. You see a little bit of a de decline here, which is indicative of a absorption depth of about one to one and a half nanometer. But for sure, it's not bigger, yeah? So we know that all of this transfer spin current is being absorbed at, at maximum one to two nanometer of the film. And that's very interesting because here is sh uh, shown now what is happening. So basically we have spins generated, mobile spins generated in the bottom one are transferred to the top one, but all of them are absorbed in the bottom one to one and a half nanometer. And this is taking place at a femtosecond time scale. And the femtosecond time scale, even the exchange is not strong enough to bring into, uh, this system into equilibrium. And thereby we get a strong canting within the, within the top layer. And you can imagine if you have that, you have a kind of spring, and from that moment on I will excite higher order modes, and I get uh, standing spin wave modes in the top layer. You can nicely see it again in a single experiment. Here, picosecond time scale, here, uh, 200 uh, picosecond time scale. What we see here is just a homogeneous precession of the top layer, which I have uh, focused on before in this case, uh, 10 gigahertz. But for this five and a half nanometer cobalt top layer, I also get a very rapid precession uh, at the first few picoseconds, which are the modes which are the standing spin waves inside this five nanometer film. So I get standing spin waves with a frequency typically in the terahertz or sub, sub uh, terahertz frequency range. With a wavelength, in this case, you could say of uh, 2.7 nanometer, so of 5.5 uh, nanometer. You can uh, do beautiful physics with that because now I have a probe uh, to measure 
these uh, tear huts spin waves. I will not zoom in too much, it's a, it, this is just a uh, tutorial. I will just indicate that there are exciting things to find, and we're working on that now. What you can do now, you can change again the thickness of your top layer, and you can probe out the dispersion of these spin wave modes. You see that they are very rapidly increasing as a function of, uh, of uh, if, if I reduce the wavelengths, if I reduce the spin thickness, the frequency shoots up, and the red line is just to fit according to ordinary spin wave theory. We know that uh, these are exchange modes which have a chorotic dispersion and uh, somehow that is reflected here in this case. If the wavelengths get shorter, the, uh, the, the frequency approximately shoots up like one over the wavelength squared. But you can also measure the damping. You also see that the damping, if I come from the thicker films and go to the thinner films, also shoots up very rapidly and almost as a one over thickness squared, so wave number squared fashion. And actually this is something which has uh, hardly been addressed before, but as a theory, and in 2008, uh, 2008 uh, Jaroslav Chagovniak has uh, come up with a theory which actually uh, uh, predicts a Q squared, a wave number squared uh, increase of the, uh, the uh, damping of these films, and that's kind of due to uh, internal spin pumping. You can, uh, you, many of you will know the, the phenomenon of spin pumping. If I have a precessional magnetization, it can pump uh, angular momentum into the neighboring layers. If I now have a non-homogeneous processing medium, there can be internal spin pumping between two regions where the magnetization is processing out of phase. This goes like Q squared, like we observe here. Of course, the interesting thing is happening here, because if you see that there's a kind of critical thickness or critical time scale below which this mode, this, this mechanism is collapsing. And uh, I uh, indicated that here, and actually we now have an idea where this comes from. I'm working on that together with uh, Remba Dauna, who's a part-time theory professor in my group. I think we have uh, made some progress there, but I will uh, leave it here, just with a message that this is interesting stuff, which we can do with uh, femtosecond laser pulses, and uh, which has a lot of uh, similar phenomena, which we find also in spintronics. Now, in my uh, last time, uh, last part of the presentation, I would go to the third topic, which is an other way of combining spintronics with femtomagnetism, and that's uh, with this aim of creating this integrated magnetophotonic devices. I will spend a couple of slides of uh, reminding you of the basic findings for all optical switching of magnetization, including some very recent modeling we did. Uh, then I will show that it's possible indeed also establish, to establish all optical switching in materials in layered structures which are of relevance for, uh, for very fast and efficient uh, current-induced domain motion. And then finally, I will some, uh, in one or two slides, I will just uh, show you the latest uh, prototype of kind of uh, the proof of principle demonstrations uh, we have. So uh, let's uh, give some more background on this phenomenon of all optical switching. Uh, like uh, mentioned before, uh, first experiments in 2007 in uh, Taylor's group, where uh, it was shown that with single femtosecond laser pulses, I can switch the magnetization in a ferrimagnetic alloy, gadolinium iron or gadolinium iron cobalt, from up to down, using a single femtosecond laser pulse, and uh, where the final the orientation was determined by uh, the helicity of the light. So left or right means up or down of a magnetization. Now, uh, actually, uh, a couple of years later, it was found out that actually the same switching also occurs with linear polarized light. And you have a kind of toggle switching. So if I do a magneto-optical image of this film, uh, this is the pristine film. If I now come uh, with a, a femtosecond laser pulse, which is just linearly polarized, I uh, can write a domain. If on the same spot I absorb, ob absorb a second pulse, it is being quenched. A little bit of... Uh, artifact at the edge, but in principle the complete domain is quenched again. The third pulse, is again, the domain is there, the fourth one is gone, etc. So this toggle switching. The helicity is not of relevance, it just each next pulse flips the magnetization from up to down, from up to down. And actually it was also found now what the trick was of uh, these experiments, uh, very nice experiments by, uh, by Corzant, uh, which actually showed that uh, this is the basic switching mechanism, this toggle switching, and uh, the helicity was only giving a slight difference uh, due to magnetic circular dichroism. You can imagine if I have left or right circular polarized light with a, a material with magnetization uh, out of plane, I have slightly different uh, absorption, and thereby the onset, the threshold fluence for switching, 
in blue for left-handed circular porous light, in red for right-handed circular porous light, and in green in between for linear porous light. It's just a percent in difference in, uh, in threshold, but that can explain the early experiments. So the basic mechanism is the, uh, in this case, is just the toggle mechanism. Now, how this works uh, was uh, demonstrated very nicely in a very unique experiment using femtosecond X-ray pulses, femtosecond X-ray magnetic circular diagrism, which also gives a view on magnetization dynamics, but now in an element-specific way. So you can probe independently, separately, the magnetization on the gadolinium atoms and on the iron atoms, indicated in red and blue. What you see is that the iron magnetization is quenched more rapidly than gadolinium, which, hey, that we've seen that before, also with the pure materials. Gal iron is faster than gadolinium. Uh, somehow, iron now crosses zero, thereby for about a picosecond, I have a temporary ferromagnetic state. But this is a state which the system doesn't like because there's anti-ferromagnetic exchange between the iron and, and, the, uh, and the gadolinium. So when the material cools down, uh, they want to be anti-parallel again and you see that now the gadolinium is forced to zero, and finally, if you would wait long enough, if the system cools down, gadolinium would be fully at minus 100%, and iron fully at plus 100%. Now, uh, soon uh, a couple of groups came up with the, uh, let's say, the interpretation of this, and all of us, I think, agree on the same mechanism. Uh, we start uh, with a femtosecond laser heating. The uh, iron goes down more rapidly than the gadolinium, but now there's another process which is of relevance, which is a change scattering. A uh, an exchange scattering is just scattering between two electrons where both electrons flip their spin. In principle, for, for a pure material, it wouldn't change the magnetization. But now, since I have an alloy with two sublattices, exchange scattering can mean a lot because it can transfer spin from one sublattice to the other. And if you introduce uh, exchange scattering, now the exchange scattering between gadolinium and iron, which would conserve the total net magnetization, just means that iron would reverse its magnetization by, gadolinium, by allowing gadolinium to also lose more magnetic moment. So this exchange scattering is an essential ingredient. And finally, now I come into this uh, temporary ferromagnetic state and uh, via the uh, uh, exchange between the two sublattices, finally the gadolinium reverses and I have to switch to both sublattices. And you can imagine from yeah. this why yes. does gadolinium switch? Why does it iron switch? Very good question. And uh, from the next graph, it will be more clear. This is a question which has been, I think, postponed and overlooked. And, uh, uh, but I think I have an answer to that. But it will become clear from the, from the next graph. Uh, what, what you do see is that because this exchange scattering is irrelevant and you have to, uh, to pull one magnetization through zero, somehow I need to be relatively close to a compensation point. If I have too much gadolinium or too much cobalt, it will not work. I need to have a kind of balance between the two magnetic moments. Now, in order to find out more quantitatively what's happening, uh, we uh, uh, took up something which we already started a couple of years ago, that is uh, using this very simple, maybe oversimplified, microscopic free temperature model, but implemented now for, to a material with two sublattices. So in this case, we have a fourth uh, uh, differential equation because we have one for the magnetization on the one sublattice and one for the other. We again use the uh, uh, LEGFET spin flip scattering for local dissipation, but we also introduce an exchange scattering. An exchange scattering between a spin on the gadolinium side and on the 3D uh, uh, atom side. And we plug that in. It's, uh, uh, you can again set up the uh, uh, rate equations using uh, Fermi's golden rule. Uh, of course, we also have a differential equation for lectern and lattice uh, temperature. That's uh, not changing too much, and we do it for a, uh, uh, in a mean field approach where every atom sees the average of the others. Uh, we have a concentration for the cobalt and for the gadolinium. We assume that cobalt atoms are coupled by a ferromagnetic exchange, while cobalt and gadolinium have a negative exchange and they prefer the antiparallel alignment. And finally, we do it in the most simple way we could imagine. Uh, we uh, treat everything, all the materials, with this wise spin a half model which we know is, uh, of course, uh, uh, n not a proper uh, description of gadolinium, but it works and it keeps the mathematics as simple as possible. Although we take into account that the local atomic moment on the cobalt and, uh, and gadolinium is, is rather different. 1.6 Bohr magneton for cobalt sites and 7.5 for the gadolinium. But they all see just the average of all the other atoms. And then if you do that, you can easily uh, uh, produce a, a, a phase diagram for switching. 
What you see here vertically is the laser power and horizontally is the concentration of cobalt for a cobalt ion alloy. You see you have a region where you establish switching and where you don't have switching in blue and yellow. And this dashed vertical line is the uh, uh, compensation point for the magnetization at room temperature. At 76%, 76%, there's no net magnetic moment in the material according to our calculation. Yes, please. Why did Brea's slide could you see Brea's slide? Why did it have the same sign of changing the rock for all these? Ah, sorry. <laughs> this must be smaller then. No, so, uh, sorry. Uh, the, the, sorry. So this one must be smaller. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, of course, uh, the cobalt and gadolinium couple antiferromagnetically. So this is a typo. This should be smaller. Thank you very much. And you get this uh, immediately, very simple calculation. Uh, you get uh, this phase diagram. And you can see now what is happening. If the laser power is too low, even if you're close to, uh, to the, the compensation point, clearly you get no switching. Cobalt is demagnetizing, demagnetizing gadolinium is demagnetizing, but not far enough, so I get no switching. I need to reach, the electron temperature somehow needs to uh, reach the Curie temperature in order to be able to switch. I can increase the laser fluence, and then I get these graphs. And you can see, hey, this is very similar to what we saw in the experiments in the femtosecond XMCD. Cobalt is more rapidly demagnetizing than gadolinium. <coughs> There's additional exchange scattering, and for about a picosecond, I have the ferromagnetic state. And uh, now the gadolinium is pushed through zero. And now Sagita's question, uh, why is it switching? Uh, if you look, because now we can pinpoint it in the calculations, and the reason it is switching is, uh, first of all, it is, of course, the mutual exchange field, which is the driving force, but the cobalt has a much larger exchange than the gadolinium, and thereby the driving force for the cobalt to remagnetize is stronger than for the gadolinium. So you will always see that the material which has the largest uh, uh, interatomic exchange, that is also the one which has the largest TC, is the one which would stay, and the one with the lower TC and the lower interatomic exchange is willing to go to the other side. And you can just look in, in, the, in the rate equations that this is the mechanism, at least according to this theory. Um, if you had this gadolinium iron with cobalt in it, yeah. and instead of cobalt, which as you say, antiferromagnetically coupled, you yeah. put copper yeah. in it, do you see the switching? Of gadolinium and iron? You would, uh, uh, no, in, in, in gadolinium, iron, cobalt. Yes, if you insert copper. If, if gadolinium is there, cobalt, yeah. is, uh, sorry, gadolinium yeah. is there, iron is there, yeah. which are also antiferromagnetical. <laughs> yeah. Instead of cobalt, you put copper. And no so, cobalt at all? Yeah, if in gadolinium, iron, uh, instead of oh, cobalt. Oh, so, so we copper, still, keep, still keep iron. Exactly, but you I, replace uh, cobalt with copper, would you? Because if this is true, yeah. that this is causing the second switch, then. Putting a copper there should not cause it. Uh, I should, I should, but you can play, we didn't do that experiment yet. <laughs> uh, I could think well, it, 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 it's an easy, uh, uh, an easy thing to, to change the simulations, uh, to, to add ma materials which, ha which are paramagnetic, although we need a third site. But in principle, there's nothing against uh, with programming a little bit and it will come out. But good, as it's good we, should, we discussed that. Most interestingly, you can think what happens if I go to the right or to the left. If I go just above this border, uh, you see that uh, cobalt does demagnetize, but now, um, since there is uh, uh, too much cobalt, the amount of demagnetization of gadolinium is less, and now there's still a very strong uh, anti-parallel exchange field of the gadolinium acting on the cobalt, which now puts, uh, pulls back cobalt before crossing zero. You can imagine if I have too much of cobalt in my system, this mechanism is not working because I need to kind of have the balance between the two. And you can see what is happening here. I can go to the, the higher the concentrations, the more the cobalt is being repelled because the exchange scattering is not efficient enough anymore. Uh, one question. Uh, yeah. One question. Yeah. So, so in the previous theory, how does your laser power come into the theory part? You have uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, it's here. It is basically a uh, laser field enhances the uh, electron temperature. <coughs> and the electron temperature uh, is driving the lattice, uh, the lattice uh, the, 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 uh, driving here also the lattice uh, temperature up. But the electron temperature, you can also see, is a driving term in your uh, e differential equation for the magnetization. 
because at the end, the whole system wants to get back and, uh, and so many equilibrium again. Right, and then you use one thermal capacitor for the whole material system, or you have separated for different lattice system, uh, cobalt, gadolinium systems, different CD. Uh, I just use yeah. one uniform. Yes, yeah. in, in principle, uh, uh, I think that that is not the, 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 that, that is not crucial. Uh, but uh, you can just uh, you, you, you can just use the what what we did is just use the bulk uh, uh, heat capacities for the cobalt and the uh, whether that is a good approximation I don't know but you will see it's it's, it's not very crucial for for the outcome. Okay. Yeah. So as everybody is asking now. Yeah, I'm yeah, asking yeah. As well. So I wanted already to ask in the M3 TM model. Yeah. There is no spin temperature, and if you look at the formula, yeah. you find the electron temperature yes. describing the spins. Or yes. In, in yeah. This yeah. Yeah. Where does this happen? So well, why, do, do, why do you replace the spin temperature by the electron temperature? I, I do not. No, I think. I think what is uh, sometimes you see a theory work, which describes uh, for a single material with uh, only uh, one atom in a unit cell, uh, independently a spin temperature and a magnetization, and I think that is a, a strange concept. So basically, uh, because the spin temperature, if your magnetic system is in thermal equilibrium, the spin temperature just dictates what the magnetization is. So you either use the spin temperature, but this is nothing else as a measure of the magnetization. But of course, the, the, the fact that there's an electron temperature, if we heat up the electron system, you have more phase space scattering for electronic scattering events, and that will break the, uh, that will also influence the amount of spin flip scattering you have. I can, I can show you an, a diagram, but I think it's getting maybe too complicated to do it now, but I can, I can show you later. So you can nicely see, you can do, uh, I can show you a nice graph. If you would start at zero temperature, what happens if I now suddenly change the electron temperature, why then the magnetization also goes down? And why it's thereby should be the electron temperature, which is driving in, this, uh, uh, in our theory. But you have distribution functions in your, if you start with thermal yeah. rule yeah. and yeah. You, then you end up with distribution functions yes. and your principle have a distribution function for the spins as well, Yes. where the spin temperature would enter. Yes. And there you enter then the yeah. electron temperature. No. No? No. No. The electron temperature is the, the, the width of, describe the width of the electronic uh, population. The spin temperature is nothing else. The spin temperature uh, in our theory would be if I, uh, if I have the equilibrium magnetization versus temperature, for you it drop, uh, goes like this, then if it, it, there is a uh, in that case, if I know the magnetization, I know what the temperature is. And in that way, you can, uh, can use the spin temperature. Why we do not use this? So in principle, we could set up also a differential equation for the spin temperature, but that's not very useful because you can no longer describe what happens above the Curie temperature. So basically, if you want your theory to be valid also above the Curie temperature, you better use a magnetization, which you can still define above the Curie temperature, than an equilibrium spin temperature because... Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes? So with this nice time-dependent theory, you should be able to uh, simulate the experiment where we keep the laser fluence approximately the same. Yes. But increase the pulse duration of the laser. Yes, yes. So... We, we did that. Can you explain how come the switching persists for such a long pulse duration? Uh, I, uh, I know that uh, Schorz has, has uh, done, done that already a couple of years ago, uh, never published. Uh, but what I remember is actually, uh, I, I spoke to you about that uh, in Mainz a couple, uh, two months ago. Uh, I, what you see is exactly the same thing as what you see in experiment. Uh, if you go to picosecond pulses, it is still possible to switch, but the window where it happens is getting more narrow and more narrower. So basically, you still drive your system out of equilibrium, but less than with the femtosecond pulse. So there's still basically, if, you, if, the, if the, the power is too low, I, my, my electron temperature does not reach high enough. If it's too high, I end up in a multi-domain state. And this window in between is narrowing down if I go to longer pulses. But you immediately see that also in these calculations. But the, the peak temperature that you're reaching is yes. decreasing rapidly as you stretch out the pulse. With yes, the yes, yes. No, the, the, and of course, the, 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 where you, you can only get the switching, if your electron temperature uh, reaches the temperature above the Curie temperature and your latitude temperature remains below. And that immediately shows that basically if I go to stretch pulses, uh, that, the, that the, the bandwidth at which I get still stable switching is getting narrower. But that's also what you observe. At the, at the very short pulses, uh, no longer sufficient to cross the Curie temperature, I have to get the electron temperature much higher. 
or the short parts, <coughs> keeping the pearls the same. That's the part that puzzles me. Oh, what do you mean? But the shorter the, the pulse, if you have, uh, or if you, sell, if you keep the same laser fluence, uh, no, if you, the same, but if you keep the same energy in a shorter time, the electron temperature reaches high. Right. But why, does, why is that required to push the temperature so high above the Curie temperature to still get the switching? Well, you see it here. Otherwise, I have not enough demagnetization and I cannot cross zero. So basically, if, 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 uh, the, if the magnetization stays too high, the exchange scatter is, there's no driving field to, to get closer. You, you need a driving field to get to zero magnetization. And then you can make the switch. Yes. <laughs> I have a question uh, because um, gadolinium is a bit special along the the Graraf yes. series yeah. in the sense that it's a um, uh, zero orbital yeah. 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 system. So we can expect the spin flip time to be longer in gadolinium yeah. 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 than with uh, yeah. other yeah. Graraf. Yeah. Is it something uh, important for switching a uh, long, longer? Uh, a very good question. Uh, of, co of course, these are details which are not in a theory. So, so uh, m maybe I also refer to uh, Martin Weinel's talk. <laughs> I mean, I agree. It's it basically uh, these are all details which were, uh, will enter if you want to go beyond. So, basically, what I have tried to sketch is the most simple picture, so that basically everything what is more special uh, you consider as an enrichment of, of, of the picture. Of course, terbium shows different response than gadolinium, which probably also will address. So. Uh, <laughs> Good question. I, yes. My question on the uh, spin temperature of yeah. free electrons. Yeah. What changement of uh, this temperature due to uh, uh, hot electrons? Just wait. Really. It was rather small. Uh, no, no. Well, well uh, hot the, 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 our assumption is that uh, the uh, uh, electron electron scattering is. Uh, uh, as extremely efficient, so uh, already uh, at a time scale shorter than the laser pearls, I am in a thermal equilibrium. So it, at every moment, we assume we have a Fermi direct distribution in the electron system. You can go beyond, but also there you see that's not really significantly affecting, and also this electron thermalization time is no more than 50 to 100 sample seconds. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the temperature, yeah, not uh, the spin temperature. You, uh, that is nothing. Uh, uh, you can speak about the spin temperature, but I rather prefer to speak of about the magnetization. Because for, for me, they are uh, uh, exchangeable parameters. Oh, uh, uh, but above the cure temperature, uh, uh, you better speak about uh, magnetization, which is left. OK, so finally, maybe the most surprising is if I have uh, too little cobalt. If I have very little cobalt and a lot of gadolinium, of course, it's very easy for cobalt to get rid of its matter at the moment by exchange scattering, and it does reverse zero. But now, since there's uh, so much gadolinium available, the, uh, due to the exchange scattering, the gadolinium hardly demagnetizes. So it stays, uh, has a large magnetic moment, thereby a strong static exchange uh, field on the cobalt, and thereby now the cobalt is pushed back. And thereby you see also again the role of this static exchange field. <laughs> now, if I have very little cobalt, cobalt can switch, but it is pushed back, and thereby also if you go at this side too far below the compensation point, there's also no switching. What is the whole picture? Uh, I'm not sure, but basically it, I think it, it gives some intuitive, fix, uh, intuitive picture of what is happening in these materials. So I should uh, speed up to, <laughs> due to this uh, discussion. We took now a quarter of an hour, so I will, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, yes, I, I, my final, maybe my final slides, I, I, sorry about this. I, I, I enjoyed the discussion, uh, but I do want to uh, uh, make a few points. Uh, because I wanted to combine with current-induced domain wall motion. Uh, for uh, ultra uh, all of the switching, we need uh, the anti-parallel sublattices, exchange scattering, PMI is not necessary but useful, different demonization times. Actually, I want to keep it out because now we saw that actually uh, it's not necessary, but I, we can discuss later. So basically, I can show you simulations where the two have the same Elliott effect demonization times and it still switches. It's this exchange scattering which is driving. If you want to have efficient current-induced domain wall motion, maybe some of you know, it's studied a lot in spintronics, and uh, this has been most efficient for PMA layers, which also are synthetic ferromagnetic systems which have a compensating magnetization, and there should be strong spin-orbit coupling, whereby you have phenomena like spin-hole effect and DMI. Sorry, I have to be now very short. The ones who don't know about this, uh, you have to take it for granted. Uh, so, uh, and then you can reach 700 nowadays, 1300 meters per second if you have uh, a magnetization compensation uh, point. 
And you see that actually there's uh, quite some similarities. I need this anti-parallel sublattice for all of the switching, but also for efficient domain wall motion. PMA is very useful, and if I could do the all optical switching in materials with strong spin orbit coupling, I might do both tricks in the same material. And if that's possible, we could kind of realize our dream, we could make a me photonic memory, we can communicate between two fast trains, one representing the, uh, the uh, photonic waveguide, the other the magnetic racetrack. We can uh, write uh, information back and forth without any intermediate electronic steps, like changing uh, from ICE to TALI without having to stop at the platform. You can just hop from one to the other. And, uh, but we have to engineer the proper stacks to realize that. Now, I will show that it's possible. All of the switching of spintronic materials so rather than do it in alloys, we want to do it in a synthetic ferromagnet because those are the materials which are of use for efficient spintronics. Now, there are theoretical predictions which have shown that it should be possible. Also experiments, Stefan Mangin, who will come later this week, has done a lot of experiments in the consortium, also with Geisel Slauten and with San Diego involved. And many of these synthetic ferromagnets indeed show all of the switching. But in all of these experiments, it was done uh, using a laser uh, pulsing at a certain repetition rate with a certain helicity, and you then drag your laser spot across the surface and you leave behind a trace of reverse magnetization. But it was also shown that in none of these examples, single pulse switching was established. And the single pulse versus multipulse will certainly be discussed during the rest of the conference. Now, we tried it with a trilayer, a synthetic ferromagnet, platinum, cobalt, gadolinium. Uh, why platinum, platinum, cobalt has large spin orbit coupling, so it gives a PMA, gives DMI, and gives the Hall effect. Why gadolinium? Because gadolinium <laughs> couples antiferromagnetically with the cobalt. Now there's one problem, that is gadolinium has a Curie temperature which is below temperature for the very thin films, even far below room temperature, but still there's proximity induced magnetization uh, at the interface, and that might still do the job. That it uh, could work is shown in this squid VSM measurement. You see the absolute value of a magnetization as a function of temperature. And indeed, you see there's a compensation point where the net magnetization is zero. And you can uh, analyze these graphs. If you know what the magnetic moment of the cobalt is, you can deduce from it what is the saturation magnetization of your gadolinium film, which is 1.8 mega amp per meter, close to the bulk value. And you can also deduce that the amount of induced magnetic moment at room temperature is about half a nanometer. So one to two monolayers of gadolinium. And the question is, do they establish, indeed, give they rise to the all optical switching. Now here is the experiment, again the same experiment which I showed for the Lois, a first laser pulse, nicely so the domain. A second one, completely gone, no edge effects, works perfectly. The third one, the fourth, the fifth, this is just a toggle switching, like we hoped for, but now in the synthetic system. You can do more detailed experiments, you can now change the laser fluence, and you see here uh, magneto optical images after a single femtosecond pulse, at increasing uh, laser en energies in the laser pulse. And you see below a threshold, there's no domain written. And if the uh, uh, energy gets larger, the domains are bigger. Now that can be interpreted in a very simple way. If you see, assume that everything is a local process, we have a Gaussian laser pulse, and the higher the intensity, the larger the, uh, the area uh, where the electron temperature reaches a temperature above the Curie temperature. You can use this as a model to fit the graphs here is now the domain size versus energy, uh, pulse energy, and you see indeed it fits beautifully. For four sets of different thicknesses of the cobalt, you see the threshold fluence gets down for thinner films, and we believe that's just due to the lower cure temperature of the very thin platinum cobalt. Also, you see that the threshold fluence can be transferred to an area of 50 times 50 nanometers of just 50 fem femtojoules. And this is the laser intensity. This is not the absorbed, this is not the dissipated energy. This is the laser intensity. So the absorbed laser power is even a factor of two or three smaller. And also you see it's no helicity dependence, just toggle switching and very uh, reproducible. Uh, more than 10 million switches we can do without any error. And it works also at 100 kilohertz, which is the highest uh, uh, repetition rate which we tried. It becomes even more surprising, exciting, uh, what is here now threshold fluence as a function of layer thickness. Uh, these four dots are for the cobalt, which I showed before. But here we now have a cobalt nickel bottom electrode, also with PMA. And you see that actually it keeps on switching even up to six repeats where you have five nanometer of cobalt nickel ferromagnetic electrode. 
but uh, this is 10 times as large as the thickness of the induced moment in the gadolinium. And so we are way off from the conversation point. So how is it possible that we can still switch? Now, to find out, uh, we again did our uh, M3TM model, uh, but now in a slab-wise way. So basically, we have slabs of cobalt, slabs of gadolinium, again, with the same exchange parameters, exchange scattering. But of course, now the exchange scattering is only of relevance at the interface here. You can do exactly the same calculation, same parameters, and you get the following comparison of the uh, switching diagram for the alloy and for the bilayer. Of course, here we don't have a concentration, what's plotted here, a uh, fixed amount of gadolinium and increasing number of, uh, of cobalt. Now you see that there is not a kind of maximum like here. I, uh, if I have more uh, cobalt layers, I can still switch if I have enough energy put in. And uh, that, uh, that, that means that somehow it seems to be more robust and I do not need the composition. And how is that possible? Well, you can see if I zoom in now to a layer-dependent magnetization dynamics, you see here for five monolayers of cobalt and three of uh, uh, gadolinium, you see the magnetization of the different layers. You see some nice features. The blue ones are the gadolinium. You see that this is the layer at the interface, the second, the third, because it's proximity induced. Here have a large moment at the interface and the magnetization dies out exponentially uh, when I go away from this interface. Uh, there are all kinds of other details, but in principle you see again the same thing. I have a, for a picosecond, I have ferromagnetic state, but the uh, really smoking gun is actually if I zoom in here and you see the switching now, this dark red layer is the layer which is directly adjacent to the gadolinium and this one switches first and then the other and then the other. So somehow this information is being now propagated through the material. You have the fast switching at the interface, but once the layer does switch, it takes care that the rest is also switched. And thereby I do not need any more the compensation uh, concentration because the switching happens locally and the rest is just propagation. And that gives exactly the, uh, the alternative switching diagram which you just showed before. Now, in my last two slides... So that domain wall velocity? Uh, a, good, a, a good question. I, uh, yes. Uh, well, we, uh, uh, you can read it off. If, if you want to call that a domain wall velocity, it is, uh, it, is a, uh, it is a nanometer per picosecond. It's a thousand meters per second. Yeah, that's a, the, the, because this is a nanometer, and uh, this difference is a picos nanometer per picos. That's how, na that's, yeah, would make sense, I think. Yeah. Uh, final two slides, uh, because now we've shown that we can switch these materials. Can we also drive the, uh, the current-induced domain wall motion? Uh, yes, that's possible. Uh, here we made a strip of uh, one micrometer, and we have a MOC image, and we send pulses. Oops, sorry. This should... Ah, there it goes. So we send pulses, and we see the domain going up and down. And here are some uh, positions of the domain walls, and we can get a domain wall velocity. In this case, we have 500 nanosecond pulses of uh, 0.4 times 10 to the 12 amps per meter, which actually is an order of magnitude lower than what in principle would be possible. We are just limited at the moment by the electronics, and thereby 10 meter per second is very promising because we know if we extrapolate, it should be well possible to reach hundreds or even not 1,000 meter per second. And uh, what we find in the last slide, what we also can do, we uh, can uh, fire now laser pulses by we have a DC current in the strip. And we see that all the domains which we write are immediately taken away with the stream of the electrons. I should also say that actually the direction of domain wall motion is uh, opposite to the of the electron motion, which shows that it's not spin transfer torque, but it's really spin hall effect. And you see that basically here we measure now with an electronic signal using a whole bar geometry, and you see that sometime after firing the laser, indeed the one domain wall and the other domain wall passing. And basically, of course, this is still too slow and whatever, but in principle, this is a proof of principle demonstration that uh, these kind of devices may uh, be possible one day. Okay, uh, thereby I came to the end of my presentation uh, tutorial. Sorry for being a bit late, but it was due to the interesting discussion we had. Uh, I showed that indeed there's a lot of converging going on between spintronics and femtosecond magnetism. I discussed two routes, and I showed the first step towards integrated magnetophotonics. And you still need the answer to this question, and you may now understand what it is. This is all optical switching. Uh, 
uh, where you fire three pulses which are slightly displaced and thereby we could nicely route, uh, write our logo of the Institute for Photonic Integration. And I, uh, I claim here with, uh, with that this is the fa world's uh, fastest logo written in three times 100 femtoseconds. <laughs> Having said that, I would like to uh, thank, first of all, all the group members who contributed to this work and thank you for your attention.